curious facts and the burning thirst for knowledge. Um, what problems is Zizek saddled with if um, he makes uh, his uh, Lacan and his uh, Freud, well, they say Lacan is supposed to be, call himself an Orthodox Freudian. Um, so there's a teaching being developed and then we could ask already at once, is, is the mode of development to be determined in an overhapped way, in a Kantian way? Uh, some people have, with considerable justice, uh, claimed that Kant did not produce the critical philosophy, but rather the philosophy of Überhaupt. Um, and one can say um, the style of the so-called uh, physical science is really, uh, or the um, science of nature in the modern sense, is really exactly this, to say that we can give you knowledge as a generalized law. Um, this uh, style of knowledge we could set off against um, history and against um, anything which says so we're going to tell you about something which only happened once. So all the doings in Athens, Socrates, um, Alcibiades, um, uh, various um, treacheries and going over to the Spartans and coming back and being uh, called in to um, manage a court case about some generals who failed to pick up, uh, I mean Socrates as in his um, role as a tea cast uh, who had to actually filibuster to try to calm down the Athenians who wanted to kill their, their, their best um, generals or admirals for not picking up dead bodies because this is not to uh, bring about miasma which would or, or, or spirits that would haunt the people and um, so there's very um, unrepeatable conditions right um, there's no more this uh, policies there's no more Sparta Athens and it can't be repeated um, so far as it would appear um, this is supposed to set off against generalized things. Then if you push it to an eternal recurrence, you could see how that could then become a generalized law that under certain conditions you'd get um, this self-same Socrates and this self-same Alcibiades in these self exact um, identical uh, things happening. Okay, so where does... Um, um, and then against this division, so actually this is a tricky point. Um, that's the that's the way the division stands, the way the sciences see themselves. But there's also um, the incursion of this early twentieth century avant garde um, move away from. Uh, science of nature or science that deals with the physical which is what Einstein's talking about in the EPR paper if we're going to deal with the physical we need some concepts such as um, F equals M, uh, F equals uh, mass um, F equals M of A uh, mass times acceleration so that you have to have some concept like that to do uh, Newton's uh, physics, right? But then in a modified form we get the E equals MC squared isn't the original way Einstein formulated, but in any case you get that the, something like that which um, then gives you a different um, notion of the physical of force. But when you go over to the quantum physics, what Einstein is saying is this isn't really a science anymore. It says nothing general anymore. Uh, it depends. So the big deal is it depends on some guys under very specific conditions decide to set up an experiment and look for something in particular. Um, so it has a different 
flavor and then it could only be boxed in by these simple kind of um, Venn diagram uh, set theory type of notions like the, um, uh, the Bell, Bell's theorem um, and, and then you could make very exact predictions in this way okay so the but the challenge I think Jijic is um, settled with here is then uh, how is the big other taken as I take the big other to mean the same as like tertiary qualities like the um, shoes of the peasant woman in Heidegger or as Leo Strauss always gives the example the, um, the, the, the sacred cow of the Hindu so the Hindu immediately sees the cow and the cow is already um, sacred so then you'd later on have to have a theory about why that's only a tertiary subjective uh, thing that some Hindus believe in uh, you'd have to have a little explanation about that that would then come afterwards so that the primary phenomenon for the Hindu would be just like the primary phenomenon for the um, ancient Athenian would be the thought of the miasma um, and for us it's given this name ideology although we never know exactly what it is that we supposedly believe perhaps because we're still open within it and it's still, it's not an object um, inspected with a lamp or a, a, a torch um, but it's an ongoing concern um, so yeah how does this big other concept then come into contact with the basic uh, questions of the uh, foundations of the sciences um, and not only from within the perspective of the current physics and its current problems as would be represented by um, uh, Maud, Maud Lynn, uh, Timothy Maudlin because um, he could tell you all about the um, nooks and corners and the um, uh, the attic walkways with the door and mirror windows and the creaking that you hear above um, of that uh, of the current physicists of the people that right now call themselves physicists and write papers under the name physicist um, but what would happen if some of the current physicists started thinking including the problems that I just named in the first part of this talk which are the problems that were the problems of the early 20th century avant-garde uh, physics. Um, Schrodinger and so on. Um, uh, then we would have physicists that would be dealing with totally different problems and the um, Timothy Maudlin version wouldn't work because it wouldn't cover those, those subject matter. Um, Said, so since we're in an open position, um, it's difficult to specify it in the same way we can with the um, Hindu and the uh, uh, ancient Athenian in some ways. 